March 7th shall now come to order. Uh, Kate, could you uh, call the roll, please? Absolutely. Steve Hinnick? Present. Mitzi Rosillian? Here. Tracy Miller will not be here. She's excused. Um, Jennifer Peterson? Present. John Reardon? Here. Bobby Stauffer? Here. John Weitzel? Here. Great, thank you. We have a quorum. Uh, I hope everybody's had a chance to look at our February 7th meeting minutes. Uh, any comments, corrections, additions, anything else on there that look okay? Uh, then I would move that we approve the minutes of uh, February 7th of the Historic Preservation Commission. Do I hear a second? Uh, John Reardon has seconded it. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The minutes shall stand as written. Okay, uh, tonight, do we have any uh, public comment f on any of the items on the agenda tonight? Uh, if you'd keep your comments to three minutes or less. Hearing no one coming forward or seeing no one coming forward, we'll get into uh, our first item, which is uh, a update on our uh, caretaker's house project out at the Basin Creek Reservoir. Kate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, this is the same picture that I showed you last month. I'm, I, don't, I haven't been out to see the house. I'm assuming that um, John Snyder has been doing the work as he can with the weather. Uh, my update is basically about that I am plugging along at the research on the National Register nomination. And so um, that's, that is coming, coming along. And I'm getting some feedback from the State Historic Preservation Office about where I should be focusing. It's very hard to find ways to tie in Lincoln Hair with this particular building. I mean, they're very prevalent all over the place on the other major structures that they have put together, but this house in particular, there's not much information um, beside the fact that we know that they built it because they're stamped on the blueprints. I guess I thought it would be a bigger deal. <laughs> all right. Any other, any co specific comments for our historic preservation officer concerning this project? Uh, hopefully come spring, which is not that, well, we're gonna get uh, daylight saving time here next week. Um, oh great, let's move on to our uh, staff and member report. Uh, Kate, would you update us on what you've been doing, please? Thank you, um, I have quite a few updates, as you can see. Um, the certified local government grant application that I um, asked for your approval on last month was submitted, approved, and um, already been contracted. So that's all set. Um, the Jacobs House. So we had a situation in the Jacobs House where the pipes froze in January and the basement flooded. Uh, we had day spring restoration come to assist in the drying out of the building. There was a lot of water in the basement. Um, I'm not gonna lie. And so we have Staley Engineering coming in two weeks to assess the basement to make sure that it is still adequately supported. Basically, um, there was one weekend that there was, there was no one in residence, and that particular weekend, they didn't keep the water dripping, and so the pipes froze and broke in the basement, and all the toilets broke, and all of the boiler and all the workings in the basement um, need to be replaced. So um, we are following the National Park Service guidelines on flood adaptation. We're rehabilitating historic buildings, which, um, which luckily they have out now. I brought it with me. Um, thanks to all the crazy weather and flooding and everything that's going on in the country all around us. So we'll be sure to follow that. Um, another thing is, so I visited with um, Jeanette Koff of the World Museum of Mining. Uh, along with the government buildings team to discuss potential stabilization and work on the St. Patrick's Mission Church. Obviously, this church has been brought in from elsewhere. Actually, believe it or not, it will be 50 years in the same spot in just three years, so um, we might figure out whether or not we want to apply for its, you know, for the National Register for it on its own for being there for 50 years, because it is a pretty important building otherwise. I, it's kind of a it's a log structure. So basically one of the walls is curving out uh, and they're talking about rechinking the logs and actually placing a foundation beneath it because it doesn't have one. Another thing is um, I will be collaborating 
with the Forest Service and the Butte Silver Bow Water Operation team on another determination of eligibility. Uh, as both Butte and the Forest Service are doing work simultaneously on the same area up at Basin Creek Reservoir. So it's a determination of eligibility for the road. So it's a linear feature. I will be contributing to the entire water company water system, which is most definitely eligible. But the good thing is, is that it ties in very nicely to the research that I'm already doing on the caretaker's house. On the 31st of March, I, will be, I was asked to participate in an online forum for the Urban History Association. So um, the Malmstrom Air Force Base historian I've known for a few years, he is a member of this Urban History Association and they asked him to put together a panel to discuss careers in cultural resource management outside of academia. Um, and I feel like I've done pretty much every single one of them at some point. So um, other participant will be Kira Ryan, who's with the Montana History Foundation, or now they're the Foundation for Montana History. They changed their name. I know. Um, <laughs> so another thing about Kira, I know, um, is that we have recruited her to come and kick off our new series, speaking series, event series, I should say, um, even series, at the B'nai Israel Cultural Center. And so she, who is an Irish native, um, will be giving a presentation entitled Ethnic Patriotism, Butte's Irish Community, 1880 to 1920. So please, all of you, please come and attend. It'll be great. She's a wonderful speaker. And finally, the National Park Service representatives will be coming to Butte. They're actually, they're coming to Montana, they're coming to Helena, and they'll be spending a few days. And one of the things that they would like to do is make a day trip to Butte. So it's a great opportunity for us to really show off our landmark. That is gonna be in May. I don't think the one has anything to do with the other. They just happen to be coming up from Colorado and they're visiting a few sites up in Helena. Kate Hampton's gonna be coming with them and they just wanna do a day trip and you know, do a little tour. Well, we of the are the or. largest historic district well, in the nation. So exactly, I mean, we have a lot to be up. proud of. That's right, so good. That's it. Uh, all right, keep going. Kate, if you have anything further. That is, that is all I've got. Got. Well, I think it's great that they're coming here, you know, the uh, Park Service. Maybe they can bring us some updated brochures on the, uh, the uh, Secretary Standards for Rehabilitation. Some complimentary copies. Okay, let's uh, move right into uh, some of our new business. We have a COA design review for window replacement at the old YMCA at 401 to 409 West Park Street. Uh, Kate, could you give us a brief update on this? Well, what this basically is, is an update. Um, you have already seen this, this COA before. Um, this is the Butte YMCA. Um, I have, we have Leslie Gilmore on the phone waiting to join us. And um, let me get to my own area of the COA, sorry. So the update, if you'll recall, um, Leslie was visiting with us about the replacement or potential rehabilitation of the windows. Now, this phase of the project, this is a, a 1918 building, and this phase of the project is um, the bottom, two bottom floor windows that face the road. And she's gone back and forth between the building owners, and what ha they've come up with is that the owners are committed to the series, Anderson Series 100 five rec, single hung windows with simulated divided lights. So this this phase will replace the first and second floor of the south and east facades facing the street. They will all be operational and matching in appearance with the current windows. Um, and should this first phase go well with these windows, that's what they would like to do with, uh, with the many, many other windows on the upper floors. So, um, and, and Leslie, is there anything that you would like to add? No, I think you covered that really well, thank you. 
Okay, did we ever get a diagram of what these uh, replacement windows, how they would fit into the sash that there, that's there? I mean, these are photographs. These are the windows themselves. Oh. Right, so there's, if you look at the first floor, there's uh, one that has uh, three divided windows, and then there's one that are two. Are they going to be offset like that? I mean, the double hung or the single hung? Will it be larger on the bottom than the top to match what that is, or are they, is that a, a separate, is that a fixed plate pane up above and then a double hung below? Leslie, can you, um, hear, can you, oh. yes. yeah, I th I'm, if I'm understanding your question right, there's somewhere we have a transom above a double hung. Is that what you mean? I didn't know those were double hung down below. Yeah. So the double hung down below would be would be a new one, probably single hung actually, to match the um, uh, well, it, like, appearance of the double hung, and then the upper one would be a transom. And um, whether they're, I, I, I know some of them are operable, the transoms, and some are not. Does that answer your question? I'm because you're a little. Well, um, some drawings would have been very helpful. You know, an elevation drawing of the how the replacement windows would look, that would have helped me. As I look at this picture, uh, you've got. Some openings that have one, two, three, four, five, six separate uh, distinct window areas. Then there's another one with two. The one with two does not appear to be a double hung window right now. Is that correct? Okay, I, um, I, I can't, I don't know what you're looking at. So, um, uh, the elevation so, um, drawing. You're saying on the second floor. Uh, the first, the this is for, I was talking about the first floor. Uh, oh. Why don't you go Is to that like full elevation window? drawing? You know that one picture there. Oh, oh, that doesn't show the first floor, does oh, it? That's my fault. <laughs> yeah, the southeast corner of the facade. There's a first floor. There's a window that looks like it's fixed. It's not a double hung now. That's the only, my question. Is that going to be double hung, as well? So would, can, can you help me which window is he looking at? The, can you tell me which page you're on, Mr. Chair? It would be the oh, furthest well, east window on the south facade, it appears. Okay. And it is, uh, it's a bit wider than the, the, tri the tripartite windows. It's got a transom and a, an almost a square bottom uh, pane. And it's subdivided into 12 lights. Is that going to be fixed or a double hung there? Do you have a I'm sorry, I agent? still don't understand which window you're looking at. You're on the south facade. So south facade. On west Park Street. South um, facade, the window that's uh, on the first floor, furthest on the east. So east it's figure six floor. in the submission. If you look at figure six, it's the um, window that's shown on the oh. right side. Page six, okay. Do you have your COA up? Yeah, it's it's. Figures. I have the, an older COA. I think it probably is the same photos of the existing building. And um, so you're, but you're on page six. Is it figure six it's, or? It's eight. Six, six of eight and it's figure six. Um, okay. and, and I haven't changed anything as far as up, up to that point on your COA. Right. You're, the, okay, gotcha. So I know what, and I understand your, um, why you're asking that question. Gotcha. Oops, and I just flipped it away. Okay. Um, now that's the transom over a fixed unit, I think. Um, and um, so it would be, um, and I think it's an operable transom. I'll have to double check. But um, if it's an operable window, as Kate said, you know, and um, if it's an operable window, we'll make it operable again. But I don't believe that lower sash is operable in this case on the one you're looking at. Um, but one way to, for me to more definitively state that would be to look at the original drawings. They're actually fairly accurate. Um, and let's, I'm pointing it up on my machine. Uh, okay. Mm. Oh, but I'm, uh, I can't seem to zoom in on it. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, Okay. 
Hmm. I'm sorry, I can't tell. Um, they, they, I was bragging about the original drawings, but now I can't brag about them. Um, all I can say is if, it's, if, it's, if it was operable originally, and we'll be able to sell by the hardware and all that, then it will be operable again. Um, I'm sorry that I don't have a more definitive answer um, unless it's like, uh, well, the one here, so there, if, it, if it's similar to the one that flanks the entry, if that's in the middle of that facade, that lower sash is fixed, and the upper one is a transom. And so I'm assuming it's like that. Other, the problem with the drawing is it just says repeat. So. Oh well, um, I guess I. I this is uh, to the would be to the west of the main entry. Then, this isn't the corner. Yeah. Right. This is on okay. the west side so of the main entry. That might be like the one to say, you're talking about, though, hey, right? I'm all for new windows. I just it's kind of confusing to see it from a couple of photographs. You know, I mean that that was my question. But, so it's fixed. That's all I needed to know. And okay. then the others on and the other side are double hung. The photographs you're looking at, if I'm uh, correct, are ones that um, have, still have the boarding in them, or did, did you get more recent photographs? I mean, did it? No, these did, these are the. There is one photo that still has the boards on it. The figure five the photo boarding. is okay. still the same with the boards. Which makes it okay, and that makes it real hard to um, read. I think. And so the ones with the boards on it, they're going to be three double hungs with three transoms above it. Is that correct? Okay, what's the question? Well, uh, the three-part window, figure five, at the first floor of the West Park facade, they mm -hmm. have been since removed, but are, those are the spaces you're going to put in the double-hung windows, is that correct? Yes. And then wherever there's a fixed window down below that are, are solid, they will be fixed? Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just having a little trouble hearing. Oh, sorry about that, Leslie. Your phone. It's, it's yeah. so hard because. <laughs> Probably my phone or it, my ears. No, I'm, it's, oh. it's, so, it's real confusing with what, us what not What color looking. are you going to do these, uh, the exteriors? Did you hear the question about the color, the exterior window color? Ah, uh, no. Um, the options are limited for fibrous exterior to white, sand tone, terra tone, dark browns, and black. So I did look through the historic photographs, which, as you know, are not a necessarily, um, they're not going to tell you the color because they're black and white photographs, but they do give you an idea of the tone. And so we're looking at ones that seem to be a medium kind of uh, medium tone color, which might be the sand tone or the terra tone. So what we're going to do is get those samples and go to the building and um, try and sand away some of the paint so we can get down to lower levels to see the color it would have been originally because the different photos are taken at different angles and have different so different colors or different um, tones and darknesses show up what we're trying to do is match the general idea of you know whether it was really dark or really light and it seems to be kind of in between <laughs> but um that's the goal there, to um, have one of those colors try to um, be a good representative. Betsy Rizzilli, do you have a comment or question? Um, it's about the color, because I have some other comments as well, but about the color, um, I'm glad to hear that you're t tending away from the white, because that I see those all over town, and it's very jarring. And to me, the mm -hmm. darker the color, um, the more appropriate would be here because it won't be taking away from the, the brickwork in this particular image. So maybe not the black, but anyway, I'm glad that you're investigating. But if you investigate all the way down and you see white, um, I would not like that. It would be, it would be totally <laughs> inappropriate because it's... Yeah. Right, and I hear what you're saying because the brick, the tapestry brick is such a... Uh, strong character of the exterior of the building, that and the stone. And I think the windows really are meant to sort of not necessarily go away, but they're to be backgrounds uh, that supplement the uh, main um, masonry. So, yeah, hopefully, I don't, I don't think we will find white. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking right now at some of the, the degraded, you know, the photos of the degraded paint down, down to bare wood, and um, I don't see white in that. Um, we'll we'll keep you posted. Hopefully we will. I agree. Hopefully we won't find white. Um, 
And I don't think black would be appropriate either. I think it is going to be a mid-tone, just like it kind of shows in the historic photographs. And we might find more historic, historic photographs. You know, we have been to the archives, um, but we were looking at drawings at that point. Um, but we can check for more photos from them. But what's physically um, accessible in evidence on the building that's going to be the most important. Okay, so this whole concept is supposed to be carried through throughout the building eventually, is that correct? So whatever you that's do now, correct. you know, I don't necessarily need it to f end up like the things on East Park Street, you know, dwindling for six or seven months or years before something else is done. So I'm assuming you have an overall plan and color, color scheme for the whole building, is that correct? We don't have an overall color scheme for the building yet. They're really, um, they're moving slower on the YMCA because they're trying to, you know, the same owner is at 75 and at 65 East Park, and they're trying to get those done so they can actually help fund the money that's going into the YMCA building. So this could be five years. It could be a long-term, I mean, it will be a long-term project. So there isn't, and they have not spent as much time working on the design for it. They don't even have the interior layouts yet. They um, just want to get an understanding of what um, windows are going to work right so that when they do get to the upper levels, they'll have a plan in place. Yes, uh, Kate? Oh, well, I, sorry. I would just add that um, this building is mothballed um, to our standards, so, you know, and we'll keep checking on it and making sure that it, it remains so until they can actually get to it. Okay, great. And like I say, this is not in our purview. They, they bought, they've got a, a, this is a SARTA grant, isn't that correct? Okay. Yeah. It, that's great. So, I mean, I just thought maybe you have long range plans for the, the, the look of the building and things like that. So, uh, Mitzi has some further comments. So, um, I guess I didn't prepare as well as I would have liked, but, um, there are in the figure that was provided um, by Anderson Windows of grill options. There's um, um, grills between the glass, between the glass and exterior grills, full, light, full divided light, sim simulated divided light, and I don't know which one of those um, your, the proponent is um, going to use. The simulated divided light at the far right of that page of the grill options. So there will be grills on both the exterior uh -huh. and the interior. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Right. Um, and then the other part is, I assume that that because they're all custom made, so they have grill they have grill patterns that they identify in here, and they said other grill patterns are available. And so I'm assuming that, as you've said before, I just want to confirm that the pattern will be exactly the pattern that it is now in terms of that's the what Andrew, yes that's what anderson has said they can do okay um i'm just gonna get it all out <laughs> so um i certainly um appreciate the the simulated divided with permanent grills on the exterior and the interior because that will go a long way toward making it look like it's um, original. However, I continue to find that this building is important enough that um, I do not um, support um, a window such as, such as these for the first and second floor. We have had um, just last um, month, we had someone come in for the old St. James Hospital and is repairing all the windows and putting glass, reglazing them in, in their original configuration. At the Carpenters Union Hall, they um, as part of a SARTA grant, they got the glass and they had someone rebuild the windows. Um, at the Basin Caretaker's house, we have, those are, um, I'm, I think Marvin is maybe the manufacturer, but those are perfectly replicated wood windows. And 
um, the original mine yard has repaired win wood windows, or I, may I think they were wood windows. So there is, um, it is not like this is um, something that is unusual to ask for this sort of thing. Uh, in all of those buildings, those are high profile buildings in our community and so is this one. And so I continue to um, find it very hard to support this one, um, even though I certainly appreciate the, all of the um, design elements that have been incorporated. The second thing I wanna say is, um, I walk by that building at least five times a week, and maybe some, day, some weeks even more than that. And it, um, I am wondering whether or not the um, proponent is going to put rock grills or rock grates on the lower windows. They are broken out all the time because it's a really great place to throw a full bottle of beer against the windows. And if it has happened, and especially been bad in the last little while, and if the building is going to be, um, continue to be vacant for five more years, I think the investment, I think the proponent should think about investing in their product by considering some kind of rock grill or something like that until it become, it looks more habitable. I know it will look better um, and that will be less of a target, but it is, it's really been bad lately and I, I really am concerned about the longevity of the investment on the first floor west si or south side. Thank you. Right. Anyone else uh, from the commission? John Reardon, would you like to speak? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, as we were all talking again, or I was listening to the deal, I guess originally we come back here basically to discuss the uh, brigade on the south side of the windows and all that. And I think we left when basically there was, we were talking metal and replacing and, and all that. Um, but the thing about it is, is that right here in front of us, I mean, I'd like to see this, I'd like to see that, but what we got to remember here, and I'm not catering to anybody and all that, we have a project this size that is going to be very costly. I think Mitzi made some great points about protection for the windows and all that. Uh, we have a commitment for the buyers and developers that want to do this building, and basically in our specification paper here, unless we can come up with a different spec, we brought this party back this will be times two to basically research and all that. And, you know, uh, unless I'm missing something here, uh, we don't have any, I guess we could vote or take it on and all that stuff, but we have 230 windows to replace. And the last gentleman that was here that did St. James and all that, if you remember his comments and all that, is that basically finding a person or persons to do these windows and change. St. James Hospital was a task and was going to be sometimes he wondered if not if he wasn't saving any money at all. So we have a commitment from these people to make a large I, I would like to see metal windows I would like to see this I would like to see that but according to the paperwork the specifications call for the Anderson 1100 window. So I mean you know uh, the the people that are doing this project have come up they've uh, are, you know, are willing to match the color of the windows they're willing to look at. I'm sure they don't want their, their windows broken any further or when they put up windows. Uh, question is, is the color scheme on windows going to be prevalent throughout the building? I think that anybody that's been in the construction business, if they had one color of windows on the second fl first and second floor in different colors, I think that, I mean, uh, I wouldn't want to see a project like that definitely. But I think, I, I mean, we all are very opinionated and I like to deal, but the thing about it is, is we have to, we have to back up what we preach. And basically the only backup I see is the specifications that, that are provided to this group by these uh, investors to take an empty building off the market and basically redo it and be p uh, uh, part of the community. So. I think we should kind of consider on what's going on with 230 windows. We're not talking 
I mean, we are talking probably, you know, a minor amount, but those are some of the bigger windows in, in this scenario. But according to the specifications of this, of this commission, all I see is the Anderson 1100 window with grates and basically a color choice. Correct me if I'm wrong. Thank you. Thank you, John. Anyone? Uh, yes, uh, Bobby Stoffer. Um, if, if I remember correctly from last time, our, our big question was the price difference between full divided light windows and simulated divided light windows. And we had asked if the um, full divided lights would be um, budget breakers if they're out much, much more expensive than simulated. And I'm thinking that in coming back, so proposing simulated, that's the case. But I would like to know if, if the full divided light is just too expensive. Should I answer that? Yes, go ahead, Leslie. Okay, I actually don't have an answer. There ha we, we're having enough trouble getting the pricing for the simulated divided light. We've been, um, they, they met with Anderson Window two months ago at this building and they're still waiting for pricing. So we don't have a comparison. And if I'm not uh, mistaken, uh, the full divided light is simi very similar to the simulated divided light uh, with the respect that inside the two panes of glass, they have a, a piece of foam or whatever that fits in between there. So they're really not individual panes of glass. What they are is they've got a grill on the outside, a grill on the inside, and in between the glass, they have a spacer that fits right. in there. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Okay. So really, the only difference between the simulated and the full are, is the space in between the glazing that has, would have right. like a vinyl piece of, of uh, material that fills that in. So uh, we have in the past, we have approved this, w this 100 series window in, in pretty much everything that's come forward to us in the last two or three years. I think that it's a great step forward. These Anderson windows are durable. They, they'll, they, they should last. Uh, I think something in the bronze, uh, the bronze color would be suggestive just because it's not black, it's not uh, brown, but it's fairly neutral. I think something like that would be very handsome on the building. And uh, I would move that we go forward and uh, approve this COA using the 100 series Anderson windows with the custom grills to match the existing. And uh, if there's any discussion or, or any new uh, information as far as the original color, uh, we'd like to know that. But uh, up until that point, we don't want white. <laughs> so do I hear a second? It's been moved and seconded. John Reardon has seconded. Any other discussion on the question? Jo John. Weitzel. Yes, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> One of the little things I'd like to bring out here, too, is the fact that we have uh, the new technologies that we have are so much more efficient than they were 100 years ago. And these people are going to be putting a lot of money into this building, and it's a big building, and it's going to take an awful lot to heat it. And in my opinion, I think they should go with the most efficient uh, you can do because uh, the, the glass is even better it is more tempered and it's more stronger it's double pane and uh, God knows I've got you know single pane windows in my house and it's it's not very efficient and so if these people are going to be investing lots of money like this into this building I, I would I, I don't see a problem with them trying to make it as efficient as they can for energy use especially with the way the prices and everything are going up now thank you any other discussion? Okay. Uh, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. We have one opposed. The motion carries. Uh, good luck and keep us in foot lab. Would you give us a, we'd like to see those samples on these 100s. You know, the uh, color sample. We'd love to see the colored samples. Uh, we've had lots of these people come in and no one ever really brings in a full color sample. Uh, I would imagine that uh, 
you're going to have to have some drawings to, of these openings. So uh, good luck and uh, Godspeed. Thank you. All right, moving Thank along. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Kate. I'll sign off now then. Have, have a good night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Thanks. Right, you too. Bye-bye. Okay, moving along, we have a COA for 130 West Galena Street. There's a mural project. Uh, Kate, would you uh, show us what we're gonna, they, they okay. would like to put on this building? So here is the facade of this building. Um, it's beautiful and, and colorful. Um, the one thing I shared with you, the inventory form, um, and they did note in the 1980s that the integrity of the first floor had been compromised due to the changing of the commercial business front of the building. Um, but the ladies who own it now have done a really great job of really accenting the character defining details on the facade. Um, and it's just kind of a happy little building to look at. Uh, so, so this is part of a SARTA grant that was approved um, several years ago. Uh, and it's, it's just another continual mural in a series of murals. Uh, the difference from this one than the ones that I've, I have brought to you before is the, is the fact that it's, you know, it's a building that's on the inventory. Um, but I think that the mural itself is not overpowering. I think it follows the standards of the murals. Um, I know that a, an argument might be made that it's a primary facade, but it actually sits on two parking lots, not just one. Um, and, well, I don't know, I thought it m might be an issue, and I asked Mr. Livermore, you know, and he said, well, let's go ahead and present it anyway. And it's very colorful, um, and I really like the bird. And I think that it's not really overpowering. I think it sits on, you know, I mean, this is a large, broad side of the building here, and it would take a, a pretty small part of the building. And um, I don't really see how it's different from the Better Butte mural that's just on, just on Montana Street. I mean, that's actually way more of a busy thoroughfare, I feel like, than this one on Galena Street. So with that being said, um, I would suggest that, you know, I mean, I would, I would recommend that we approve it for Mr. Livermore and for the ladies who own the building um, and the people who reside inside um, who I know really do want it. Well, thank you, Kate. Any, uh, any comments on this uh, piece of art? Hearing none, I would move we uh, approve the mural as presented for 130 West Galena Street. Do I hear a second? Jennifer uh, Peterson has seconded that motion. Any other uh, discussion on this question? Well, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, I think it's very nice. Great. Uh, Mitzi has a comment. I'd, I'd like to make a comment about um, the murals in general. Um, Kate took us through the new mural um, guidelines that we have for the Historic Preservation Commission that were um, put together in 2021, and it meets all of those. Um, what the, the, These guidelines were put together specifically, um, well, they say for local incentive projects, but at the time it was mostly considered for URA. Um, and at that time, it was, this um, committee was told that there would be a, a design review committee, an artistic design review committee, because we did not want to be in the biz business of making decisions about art. However, um, as time goes on and there's going to be more and more murals, it is imperative that that piece of it be considered not just for URA, but also for SARDA, which is a local incentive program and any other local incentive programs that might be c coming developed forward. I won't talk about the one that was going to be um, kind of across from the Herbert Tower, but if anyone saw the drawing for it, you might have been concerned specifically about what it looked like. We have, without it, an art um, component of this, we are going to have a piece of art like that 
which the Historic Preservation Commission has no ability to deny, and yet I would have to throw myself in front of the paintbrush because it was so god-awful. And so um, the Historic Preservation Commission has done their job. I want community development or SARDA or someone else, someone to do their part with design review. Thank you. I, I kind of echo that, uh, that it's, it's difficult. Uh, I know that the, there was a committee set up uh, to review art pieces for that, you know, that fence they put on the parking garage. And there was an ad hoc committee, I think, that was put together to uh, determine whether the art is worthy enough to put along that fence. So I think something like that could be reviewed as well on these murals by someone and not necessarily make it our decision to do it. So, okay. Uh, any announce? How about a discussion on our demo grant program, uh, one that was uh, spearheaded by our illustrious commissioner, uh, Reardon? Yes. Sorry, Mr. Chair, I forgot if you guys actually voted or not. Um, oh, you did? Okay. okay. <laughs> I didn't hear the whole hide part. Okay. Well, thank you, BT. Okay, so uh, this one is coming up quite a bit. Um, and we haven't talked about it yet uh, as a group. And there's a reason for that uh, from my part that I haven't brought it before you. And that's because, um, you know, it's been my understanding during the whole process that this demolition assistance program was intending, is going to follow the ordinances. And when we saw a demolition permit come across my desk, I would bring it forth to you. Uh, and it didn't really matter. Um, well, it's, an, it's a public incentive. So, um, and, and many of these buildings well, might be, can't be sure of that, but might be um, in our district and contributing to our district. So um, with, you know, with that being said, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk lately about extra bureaucracy and things like that. And um, we are a part of that bureaucracy that, um, well, it, our ordinance states that we would have a say and input on these demolition permits as they come up. It's public money. Um, so I wanted to show you what I have put up here. So I've got the application up here. I've got a couple blurbs, you know, from our ordinance just for your refresher, I guess. But I think the reason that I wanted to talk about it today, oh, and actually this number nine here, um, that was my input. Um, is your property listed as contributing to the Butte Anaconda National Historic Landmark District? If unsure, because some of the, these homeowners may actually be unsure, um, to contact me. And I think that it's time that we go on record with just having a voice in this. And, um, you know, I think it's time that we, we go into the public record as, as basically um, making comment about this. So that's why I wanted to put it on the agenda. Thank you. Uh, anyone uh, would like to address this? I know it's been in the news a lot. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, I think the intent is to uh, eliminate some of these dangerous properties that are you know, malignant. And I do see that uh, some of the applicants' obligations for this funded project <clears throat> acquire all city per county permits and then historic preservation approval if required. Uh, I suppose that's the the one thing that during this on this application and uh, pro this program is our, our own only mentioned part. Uh, as you know, we we go through and we do uh, review these demolitions if they're not garages and stuff. So. Uh, would they or would they not come before us uh, either whole or in a uh, packet of several demolitions if it was going to be that way? And then what, uh, what authority do we have to approve or disapprove that? So I, John Reardon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
I'll just kind of fill you in a little bit and all that. It's, it's been a long road, okay? So originally when we started this program and all that, as you know, I represent District 8. Uh, we have another district above me, which is Bill Anderson. And then also across Montana Street is basically um, Eric uh, Matkins. Yes, yeah, sorry, thanks, one of those moments. So uh, that, that was my old neighborhood down there in District 8, and am I doing it just for that purpose? In the way I am, but in a way, when I was running for election, I was approached by these people that live in these neighborhoods about these houses that have been basically uh, left unattended, basically sometimes boarded up and basically turned in to crime areas because they have access to these homes. So as we proceeded along and all that stuff, it, it got worse and worse. I'm sure you have a couple articles where a guy got robbed up when he was in the hospital and was gone from his home for like 15 minutes and uh, somebody got murdered in the same area and blah, 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 which had basically uh, a lot to do with some of these homes, although one that the murder was committed was right in those newer homes across the alley. So we started working on this, and I, and, uh, I talked to JP and all that, and it, it was received and all that, and basically went to the NEC police, and, and we, we obtained 225000 And basically what we did at that time is we earmarked this money basically for houses that were already had all, met the, all the criteria, and basically, you know, they would have to come through and go through every entity to get, to get it done. Then we got hung up on a deal where it's public money and basically we had to take everybody in, into, I guess, applications and, and things like that. But the thing about it is, is I, I, I think that what we need to recognize is uh, our basically uh, the support from myself being a commissioner to this committee and also I don't think that we've had an issue with anything that has come before the council with the Historic Preservation Committee trying to preserve basically in dealing with the ordinance. And if I have, I, I would basically say it's been very minimal, if any. So as we progress down the road, this application is basically addressing the how we're gonna hand out these monies and stuff like that. This has been an ongoing situation. The money was allocated in the last budget in August and here we are in March, eight months later. So uh, we're trying to do it right. We have to come to some agreements and things like that. Uh, there's a misconception uh, that people on the council don't know what's going on with the procedure. If anybody knows what's going on, we do because we read that ordinance. And basically in some situations in dealing with these homes, this ordinance wasn't followed. So basically uh, I I can't speak for everybody that sits around this table tomorrow night, but basically when things go, and as you notice in this application, the Historic Preservation Committee is included, and you guys were included in the de last demolition permit that was issued. Maybe I missed one or something like that, but I was there when we did Placer Street. So it's very important to have you people around because this might set a new precedent that if we start working together the executive and the legislative branch is that basically we can come together and save some of these homes and have a program that will facilitate the development of these neighborhoods that haven't had nothing but blight in certain areas for a long time but i w i don't want anybody around this table to think that they've been slighted with the story by the council or our representation with historic preservation because we believe in that ordinance. So I just wanted to assert that. Thank you. Thank you, John. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, Bobby? Um, I remember when you first started talking about this um, program and you assured us that the, the homes that were targeted to be de demolished through this program with, with some help to the homeowners perhaps were ones that had already been through our process and that we had already voted that right. demolition was approved because we agreed that the, the homes were beyond saving. And I think it's wonderful to have a source of funding for four properties that we have approved demolition for, right. but for whatever reason, they have, they've been 
left standing. But so I, I'm in support of this just so that we don't get skipped in the process and that, that um, homes that are approved for funding through this program are homes that have been through our process and we have voted um, in agreement that they right. there was not nothing to do with them but to demolish them. Right. Sure, and, and I would go. You go ahead, John. Okay. Well, see, and, and that that's where everybody's involved in, and every before it was kind of because the process was wasn't gen or I would not want to use the word generic, but continual. Let's continuous from the start to the finish on a lot of these homes, and it was left up in the air. And I think that's where the issue started and all that. And, and the thing about it is, is that I'm not picking on anybody. The council isn't picking on anybody. The community wants something done about this, you know? And I think everybody has to include it. There's a lot of good stuff that's happened out of it. But the thing about it is, is we just got to get going on it. You know what I mean? And I think as, w as we do it, uh, my hope is that we can fund more and basically this will enhance, I, I don't know if you guys drive through like the five, uh, start on the 600 block of Colorado and go down Colorado, uh, Main Street to six and 700 block and all that stuff. Uh, Placer's gone. I don't know if you guys have been by there. It, it's tore down, yes. And that was a self demolition project by the gentleman himself. It's just the idea that there's, now the time constraints are be being met and it's a lot of work uh, for everybody because the process wasn't complete. I maybe the process was set up, but it was wasn't being completed very often and, and the uh, the community in uh, Enrichment program has has a budgeting for these homes, too So from what I see uh, I don't get around as much I've been busy with some other stuff is the fact I believe and I don't know if somebody would have an update that you know, with the permits that have been out there and all that, there's been four or five. I know one went down on Harrison Avenue. There's one over that went down on Aluminum. That was uh, property of Town Pump. We got Placer, and I think there's one or two more that are scheduled up on Wyoming and all that. So we're starting to see some movement here. But like I said, I think still we have to s stick with our number one that was bringing all this activity and people here is our historic situation that we present. We're the biggest in the, in the town. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, my comment is obviously if uh, a project is, once is earmarked for demolition and it is a primary building of, of, of a historic value, that uh, of course they would bring it here for us to evaluate it prior to any uh, issuing of a demolition permit. So that re continues to remain the same. All they're saying here is that they're asking uh, the respondent or the the, per, the proponent who wants to tear this building down for more information, and then it is uh, essentially graded by the staff and uh, the the wherewithal this committee, this recommendation committee, uh, and if indeed that that could actually happen prior after we approve for demolition too, so. It could, we could actually approve a demolition and it not go through because they don't meet the criteria that of, of the various, say it's not in a blighted area that's 15% or less or something like that. So I really, I don't see any problem with this at all. Uh, if they need approval, we can give it to them. If they don't, if it's a condemned property that uh, uh, we've seen this in the past with the Blue Range, where if indeed it is a, a, a hazard, that uh, let's say a fire takes place, then it's sort of, it's really out of our hands that way. But yes. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, I would just say that um, we don't, at Butte Silverboro, we don't condemn buildings. So that's been something that's come up over and over again. I mean, we have our dangerous buildings ordinance and that, we, but you know, I mean, that word has been thrown around. Thank you, I, I, I don't mean to speak out of turn. <laughs> I meant if indeed it was deemed a dangerous building. That's what it would be, not necessarily a condemned building. Okay, uh, Mitzi, do you have a comment on this, this program? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I'm, I'm not exactly sure what, 
we're commenting on? Are we commenting on the application? Or are we talking about the program in general? Can Both. I just figured this. Sorry. Okay. I just figured this was our opportunity, opportunity. to go on record. Okay. With thank our you. Thoughts and so um, I do have um, several comments, and one is um, I think. Um, because it does not say specifically in the assistance program, it says homes and buildings. Um, but what I heard John Reardon say, and what I have today, and what I've heard him say in the past, that what this program was designed to do was to, to address residential property. And um, I think if and I think that it should be straightforward and say that's what we're talking about is residential property. And say that in the first sentence, which says abandoned homes and buildings, say urban blight and abandoned neglected residential property. Um, I'd also say that um, I, I, I like the language that says this is what this is, the objectives are to enhance its aesthetics, improve safety. But I think we should also say promote historic preservation. Our um, comprehensive historic preservation plan says that every, everything that Butte Silver Boat does, there should be some consideration of historic preservation. And in fact, the things that you have put in here have actually done that. When um, neglected buildings are removed because they cannot be repaired, that that reinforces, his, promotes historic preservation, and I think that we should acknowledge that from the very beginning. But it also has a responsibility for us to make sure that when a building is pr proposed, that it meets the criteria for a demolition request, and the, and the property owner knows it before they come before the Historic Preservation Commission. So somehow, somewhere in this, when they make an application, they should know that when they come with a demolition request, they have to say, have you tried to sell it to another party? Have you, I'm, I'm looking at the other language. Um, um, have you demonstrated that it can't, have you made it offer to be moved to another location? And they need to know that from the very beginning, so they don't come and say you have to have, you have to have permission or not permission. That's not right. You have to go before the historic preservation commission. They go through the whole thing and they come and they say, well, nobody told me about that. I just want the 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 people who are going to be made application um, to know specifically what the obligations are under the historic preservation ordinance, and it's for that reason that um, I believe that under application review, the nine member project review committee is, it's a great collection of people, but the historic preservation officer or a historic preservation member is not on that list. And that is to me critical because that ensures that um, this committee, that committee could say to the proponent, who want the, the person who wants to get the grant, do you know that you're going to have to go through these, these other things? And if they're like, well, I don't, I don't want to do that, then they should not be selected as one of the, the um, successful grant awardees. They should, they should have full disclosure of what they're up against. Well, I don't think we're against anybody here, and I really, I, I think that uh, we are brought, bred in on this thing with this historic preservation approval if required. So, I mean, actually, the chief executive designates us as members to this astute body, and if he would like to designate someone from this commission as a representative on that, he certainly could, the chief executive could. Now, whether he will or not, I don't know, but I mean, it leaves an opening there, mainly because we are only an advisory board or commission here. We cannot make these uh, money grant decisions ourselves. Isn't that correct? We don't, we don't have the power to do that. 
All we can do is say, all right, uh, if indeed that building needs to be reviewed for historic uh, pres preservation, historic qualities, then that will be brought before us. Isn't that correct, uh, uh, Kate? If something is, uh, these homes of, I, I don't know, it's, it's beyond our, our control. Well, um, our vote can always be vetoed by council. It could always be appealed. Um, and as far as the other language, I would have to have the ordinance in front of me, and I don't. But um, it, yes, advis advisory board. But um, there, there is some something behind it, in that whatever you decide would have to be appealed to the higher body of the council. That's right. Thank you. Any yes, Mitzi. So I'm only making this point because I don't want a grant applicant who has been selected by the committee and says, you're all free to go, now you just have to go to the Historic Preservation Commission, and the Historic Preservation Commission says, we have our own rules, and then who is the bad guy in the whole thing? Because everybody else on the staff says it's a wonderful thing, and the Historic Preservation Commission comes at the, in at the end, and does not have, um, and is essentially made to be the bad guy. And that is what I don't, that is not appropriate. Um, and that's what my comments are about. Um, so, I, then, and there's one other thing in that regard, and that has to do with the applicant is, one of the things the applicant is supposed to provide is a plan for redevelopment. The applicant should know that if there is new construction, as a condition of demolition, it was approved by the Historic Preservation Commission, there will be design review. And so, again, everything can be appealed to council, but I don't want the applicant to get to that piece at the very end and say, yes, but I wanted to put a chicken coop in there or something like that. I know that's against code, but um, those are things that should be for information that should be provided to the applicant ahead of time so that at the end we're not the bad guy. Um, and there's... I have a question um, on the last page, on page... 10 about um, demolition costs from a professional contractor. I hope that that would be amended, even though it's not our business. Um, but this is personal um, appeal for, on my part for someone who has experience specifically in demolition. Um, and so I also, it's because it says obtained demolition cost if that means cost proposal or what, I want to know if the money is going to be paid directly to the owner or it's going to be paid to the contractor. And if it is going to be provided, if it is going to be paid directly to a contractor, then I think um, as a taxpayer, not as a member of the Historic Preservation Commission, they should be required to, be, um, to provide more than one bid for a contractor if the money is going to go directly to them. If it's all going to be handled through the owner, that's their business. And those are my comments. Uh, anyone else have any comments on this uh, piece? Yes, John uh, Weitzel, you have the floor. Yes, Mr. Chairman, yeah. Uh, one of the things I'd like to kind of clear up in my own head here is that when we're talking about this demolition review that we're doing now, we're talking about buildings that have already been designated to be torn down. And the ones that we have well, at this point, we're, we we don't we we're not. There's not a list of these buildings out there, is there, John? Um, no, not really, because we haven't really got to the uh, sequence of what well, we're going to do. My point, my, my point there. being here is that we're talking about buildings that are beyond repair, uh, buildings that have been uh, the police have been there, uh, the, the fire department's been there, the health department's been there. 
Some of these houses have had, you know, a lot of animals and human feces and everything in them. Right. And they are, they have to be gone. And I can understand why we, we want to do that. But with this application, I mean, does somebody just want, all of a sudden they want to tear down the house next to them so they can have an extra yard or something. I don't see where that would fall into this criteria with this. No. So my question is here is that with this demolition here that we, you, you, you proposed or we went and visited all these houses that are just, there, there's nothing you can really do. Closed, I mean, yeah. if somebody else wanted to go invest it privately and refurbish it, that's fine, but uh, it, it's, it's just too cost effective. Uh, my point being is that is, is there any criteria right here right now that says, well, you know, the, it, it's, it's beyond repair. I mean, we got the, the fire department can condemn places. You also have the, 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 the transients and everything else going on. And I can understand that, but uh, what I'm just saying is like with this application, all of a sudden somebody wants to, like it says, you know, buy the property next to them and tear it down so they can have a bigger yard. Right. And the house is not in that bad of shape. Do they fall into this where they can, you know, I mean, I mean is, is there any type of uh, uh, criteria that, 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 that the place has to be already well, vandalized or whatever, you know, that, that right. it's a threat to the human uh, right. the, the safety and health? Right, and, and I think, and uh, I picked up on something, it's, and in the original aspect of this and all that, she made a nice catch. I, I must, I've read this application probably 10 times, but, but maybe I should read it again, is basically this was uh, established basically dealing with homes, houses, and all that stuff. Uh, you know, a project like, uh, let's use Park Street. I mean, we wouldn't have enough funding to do that, but when you start looking at four or five houses, we do have we do have the money to do that, you know? Uh, I get ownership. Uh, if a guy does want, uh, we ran, and I think there was one to come, remember the Mitchell? May I ask anybody and all that stuff where they had, they had come up and put in for a demolition permit and then they withdrew it and then they finally went through it. And that was an historic situation home or something like that, but it, it is the fact that you know, I believe that they finally got the demolition permit but tore it down themselves, correct? Because basically there was nothing available and all that. So, I mean, we don't, we, I, I don't, I'm just speaking basically with my thoughts and, and some of the thoughts of the commissioners is that basically this was made for just properties that do need help and all that. Uh, the Beach Silver Bowl has been tearing down buildings off and on for a number of years and all that. And I mean, we're all acting like $225,000. I'm very appreciative of it, but we haven't won the Powerball here, you know. Right. I try to do the simple math and all that. It depends on the size of the buildings or the, I use building houses and all that. Uh, we're figuring as, as council members, probably four to seven houses depending on the size. And it's hard, I mean, Butte needs, in those area needs so much work, it's hard not to deviate towards something like uh, uh, dirty lots or, you know, or something right. like that. But one, one that, uh, another one that we really like to see and w we are working on, not so much us just waiting to hear, but I know there's been ongoings is the one on Main Street. And then there's another one on Colorado, 649 Colorado. So uh, if you're out cruising around, take a look at that one. That one's been standing for a while. 739 has been problematic, been through the process since 2010 and it still stands. So these are the houses that we're concerned with. And basically these guys are about ready to move back to camp, probably starting as soon as the sun melts all the snow. And that neighborhood will be active again. So, mm. but I mean, maybe there's misinterpretation by some people of the executive branch or even the legislative branch or citizens, but I mean, it, it's just time that we try to do something. I, mean, I, I, I echo that. I think mm -hmm. it is time we did something, and I think the fact that uh, this, if indeed this uh, bevy of applicants that come in and uh, they are brought through and ones that uh, require historic preservation approval or, or comments will be brought before us. Isn't that correct, Kate? Yes. Um, it it should be. Um, 
And, you know, uh, Commissioner Reardon and I were speaking earlier, and um, the s staff for Butte Silver Bow uh, did finally get a chance to visit 739 South Main just last week. But um, as, as I was explaining, I mean, there was a ton of background work that went into that visit. We don't have, uh, you know, I mean, we're talking about, you're talking about the applicants. In some cases, we can't find the applicants. Um, and the situation with that particular building is, yes, you know, our, our buildings inspector had to get in there. The fire department had to get in there. You know, the planning, community enrichment, me, um, and you know, we needed, we needed a warrant and a police escort to go in that building. Um, so there's been a lot of work going on in the background, you know, with the, you know, with the deputy county attorney. Um, we've all been working really hard. Um, so nobody's really dropped the ball on these. They, they, they've been brought to our attention and now we are, we are just going through the steps one by one just to get to the, pl the right place and to do it legally and appropriately. Um, so, you know, that's all I have to say about that, I think. The, uh, now, it also says that, you know, the people that could apply for this uh, are uh, individuals, their uh, uh, government, people like that, things that, uh, like you say, if there is no owner, that you can't find an owner, and this building is dilapidated and is re earmarked for demolition, then Butte Silver Bow or whoever would come in as the, the proponent for that application. Isn't that correct? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, um, it's hard to determine what it is earmarked at this point without a permit, um, without a permit signed by a, a homeowner. Um, there are just a lot of hoops to be jumped through in order to get to that point. Um, it's just, there's just been a lot going on in the background, I guess, to get to that. So, yeah, sometimes you don't have an owner, exactly. Well, great. Uh, John White, so uh, further yeah. uh, discussion on this point? Yeah, just a, a follow-up that I, there it is. <coughs> I brought this kind of question up a couple uh, months ago in that. <coughs> it's the same thing, and uh, before these houses and everything get to this, this shape and this is a sticky wicket how do you how, how do you tell somebody that you are inept and you are incompetent to own property i mean this is this is a sticky wicket i mean and i've seen this happen so many times and so far and i'm not going to mention any present buildings or anything but i've seen where businesses you know they the owner dies and somebody else comes in and they run it into the ground there's no maintenance on the buildings. And so next thing you know, years go by, and you sit there and you watch these buildings slowly just get to the point where they're, the, the, the cost to rehabilitate them is beyond compare. Uh, so I, I don't know what, how we, we address this private property issue when uh, you know, if somebody's endangering a child, they, they will go in and take a child away from the people. But if somebody's got a property and this property is endangering other people, I mean, how do we, how do we address this point? Like it says, you know, you are too inept, you are incompetent to own property. You are inept to own a fucking have a child. You know, it's it's uh, it's a sticky wicket. I understand that, but uh, this is, I think, where we have to start before we get to the end point where we're tearing down the houses. What we can do ahead of time to alleviate the, the, the owner of these properties because they are, are, are not qualified to, they're, they're incompetent. That's just a, a, a question I have. Right, and that's something that us at the, as the Historic Preservation Commission cannot answer. It's the, ma it's the magic question. <laughs> you know, those type of things are above our pay grade here. And, uh, you know, I think the idea is that it's a, a small amount, there's not going to be that much, uh, there's not going to be that big of an impact other than the fact that the, the neighborhood that has been selected and has been targeted and has been the uh, angst of so many p residents, uh, this is a solution to some of their problems and I think it's a great one. 
And uh, I know that the Butte, th this Historic Preservation Commission will get behind and work with the, the folks of Butte Silverbow to make it happen. That's what I would say. And uh, so those, those are the discussions that we, we would like to see our little comments that we've made. And, and I, I think uh, it's a good program and it's going to move forward. So I would say that that's the, how we summarize it here today. Okay. Uh, anything else on our agenda this evening? Uh, anyone in the uh, uh, public would like to comment on anything that's not on the agenda this evening? Uh, hearing none, I would move we are adjourned. We are adjourned. Thank you. Are there any announcements?